Today's reading is from Ephesians 1, 15 to 18. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Something that I have learnt not to do on my own is to clean the gutters of the second story section of my house. It's not just making the ladder secure that I need help with. What worries me more is falling off the roof. So my son and I would climb up onto our second story to clean the gutters together. One of us would move to the edge, usually him, with a power blower to remove the leaves from the gutter, while the other of us would be over the pitch of the roof, usually me, bracing him by holding a safety rope wrapped around both of us. Fortunately, we never had to put our very sophisticated rope system to the test, but it did give confidence to the person near the edge that they were safe to get on with what they had to do, as long as they were connected to the rope and to the person on the other end. I want to talk today about another rope, the rope of hope. Hope is a big word. We all need it. Today it is talked about a lot in many different contexts. We all want it, especially when there is uncertainty, when we feel out of control. And what a difference it makes to have hope when the pressure is really on in some area of our life. The Bible has a lot to say about hope. And as I have been checking that out again these last couple of weeks, I have bumped into the Hebrew word tikva, which is the most common word translated in the original language of the Old Testament as the Hebrew word hope. Interestingly today, the national anthem of the state of Israel is called ha tikva, the hope. It turns out that the first mention of the word tikva in the Bible is in Joshua chapter 2. In the story of Rahab, do you know her story? Rahab was living on her own because of her profession entertaining men in a house that was part of the fortress wall surrounding the city of Jericho, the gateway to the land of Canaan. It is 40 years now since the Israelites refused to believe in God's promise to them of a land and so sentenced themselves to wandering the desert for 40 years, such that by Rahab's time now, there is a whole new generation with Joshua and Caleb, the only two left of their age who fled Egypt as slaves. Rahab would have been able to look out her window and see these Israelites now camped just across the Jordan River, about to hit Jericho. I wonder what you see when you look towards the horizon. What are you expecting to come next? What is your hope? Who is your hope? Where? is your hope. Rahab and the population of Jericho knew the Israelites came with a reputation. They had been on the move and no one had yet been able to stand against them. Arad, the Amorites, Bashan, Moab, and the five kings of Midian, no less, had all been already dispatched by the Israelites. And now it was time for them to cross the Jordan River 
opposite Jericho. So the city is in lockdown, in fear, for good reason. Does that sound familiar? Joshua sent two spies secretly to check out Jericho. They end up being sheltered by Rahab. She protects them from the king of Jericho, who has heard of the spies' arrival. She hides them under stalks of flax, the Bible tells us, drying on her roof. Joshua chapter 2 verse 9 says that she already knew that God had given her city to the Israelites. In verse 11, Rahab says, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. And so she does a deal, putting her hope and the lives of her probably estranged family, due to her occupation, in the hands of the spies. She helps the spies then get away by letting them down outside the wall, by a rope from a window in her house. And what is the sign of their deal? Verse 18, she is to tie the scarlet cord, the thread or the rope, depending on your translation of the Bible, made of dried flax, I reckon, and dyed red in her window to mark the location of her house when the Israelite army turn up. Part of the same rope she let the spies down by from her window. And sure enough, when the walls miraculously come all tumbling down in chapter 6, the scarlet rope hangs there in the window, marking the spot. And Rahab and her family are the only Jericho citizens who survive that day. Now, guess what? It turns out this is the first mention of the word tikvah in the Bible, usually translated as hope, but here translated as, wait for it, rope or cord. Uh, the Hebrew language has these kinds of exceptions, as do other languages, even English. This is the rope of hope, literally. Now, what a powerful picture this is. It's why I have a scarlet rope here on the table today. The root meaning of tikva speaks about multiple strands being combined, giving us something to hope for, to expect, to wait for. So what can we take from this? What does hope look like here that you and I can apply to our lives in 2020? At least two things, I think. The boldness of Rahab's faith and the confidence of Rahab's waiting. So first, the boldness of Rahab's faith. Rahab was putting her faith in a red rope <laughs> hanging in her window. It represented her hope. It was a sign, an indication of how serious she was, of where she boldly knew the answer to her predicament lay. It was the guarantee that she and her family would be spared. But she had to choose to tie it there in the window and leave it there, visible to everyone, ready for what was coming. Sometimes when the pressure is on for us, we can despair, can't we? Or become quite cynical. Not Rahab. She might have felt unworthy, Effectively, she was imprisoned, and she would have very much felt helpless. But rather than stay stuck there, she steps forward, despite the risks, and then stood firm in her choice. She followed right through. She boldly separated herself from the rest of Jericho's population, based on what she knew of the God of heaven and earth evidenced by what had already happened in other places, choosing to make space 
for God to save her and her family to have a different future. Now, I know some of us are doing it very tough at the moment. You might feel hopeless. <laughs> Many of us have lost jobs or had huge cutbacks in our hours or our income has diminished. The pressure is on at home, isn't it, for so many of us. Relationships are being blessed, but also tested during these last couple months. School and university have not been normal at all. I think of a few people that I know right now who are processing particularly serious health challenges. I think of our Persian refugee friends who are not eligible for any job keeper or job seeker support. Rahab's story points us to the fact that her story and your story and our story is not over yet. There is always hope when God is involved and we can boldly keep putting our faith in him as the one who sees it all and knows it all and is always also ahead of us. Then secondly, on top of the boldness of Rahab's faith, we see the confidence of Rahab's waiting. As certain as she was that the spies would keep their side of the bargain, she still had to wait, to hold on till her time came for the rescue and for the rescue of her family. What a great picture of hope this is. To wait at the window, to look out the window every day, probably on tiptoes, I would expect sometimes, much like the father in the prodigal son's story that Jesus told. But to wait with confidence, even though she could not be sure of the timing of what was coming or of all the details of how it would happen. Even when soon she was gonna be watching the Israelites march around her city walls every day for a week and then seven times in one day and still trust that she and her family would not be forgotten. And if you know the rest of the story, you will know that God went on to use Rahab to be a part of the next sweep of history of his people that she was now about to join. Soon she marries. She becomes the mother, it turns out, of Boaz. Have you heard of Boaz? Yes, the Boaz who marries Ruth. They have a son, Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse. Yes, who is the father of David, King David. So Rahab is David's great, great grandmother. And so there's more that follows, isn't there? Rahab gets mentioned three times in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter one, Rahab is called in the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus, she is there in the list. God organizes a non-Israelite Canaanite woman with her occupation of all things to become part of the line of the tribe of Judah, no less, from which God himself would come to this earth in the person of Jesus. And then in the great heroes of the faith chapter of Hebrews 11, Rahab gets a whole verse, which is more than David gets. And a little later, James also uses her as an example in his letter of how we should be putting our faith into action. This is one amazing woman. Who would have thought? No one would be more surprised than Rahab to see what God could do with her life, surrendered to him as she put her hope 
in him. Now, what about you and me? Do you think it's too hard? It's too late? Have you lost hope? Only God knows what will flow from our willingness to take a step and put our hope in him and then take another step and another. I wonder where even now you and I need to do just that. Now you may feel like you are just holding on at the moment by a thread. Rahab's story reminds us that that is enough as we hold on to our hope in God's faithfulness, to his character and his promises. And so we can take courage, especially in the waiting. And we can keep holding onto his rope of hope with confidence. It turns out that there is a scarlet thread through the whole of the Bible. In fact, through all of history, from beginning to end, as God keeps showing his love and his commitment to us right up to the time Jesus came, and he continues still to the present day. A thread, a cord, a rope of hope Do you remember one time it was uh, in the blood of the Passover lambs? That's the scarlet thread on the door frames in Egypt. For Rahab, it literally was a scarlet cord in a window. Ultimately, it took the blood of Jesus crucified on a cross, whereby God threw us a lifeline, a rope of a kind. So we can all and always grab God's rope of hope. It is never out of reach because of Jesus. A little earlier, Jeremy read from Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 18 in that chapter tells us that our hearts thrive on hope. Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So we need God's light, his revelation, to see what he can see. Rahab could see what the rest of Jericho did not. In order, says Paul, that you may know, know right now in the present, know the hope to which God has called you, called you. It's real. It's available now. And it's drawing us, it's pushing us uh, into his future for us. And that verse finishes off by talking about the riches of his glorious inheritance, inheritance in the saints like Rahab. And so it's you and me as well. That's how we are to live, how we can live when we reach out to Jesus. I want to encourage you today, wherever you are at, to get to know Jesus better, to take a step of hope, to grab that rope, to grab it again and again, and to keep holding to the rope, to hang on. We all have a past, of course. Rahab had a past. But God wonderfully can redesign what flows out of that for each of us. And he will even use it to serve his purposes in remarkable, surprising, miraculous ways. There is always new hope. That's why we chose to change our name, to communicate that even more strongly as a church community. 
Two weeks ago, the world celebrated the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. And in her brief speech for that occasion, just two weeks ago, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, who remembers the day very well in 1945, when she was a 19-year-old, she reflected that during the war, the outlook seemed bleak. The end distant, she said. The outcome uncertain. And then she quoted Churchill's famous words that we never gave up. And so today she said, we never give up. We never despair. The followers of Jesus can say that uh, and more. And we can have a worldview that is just so, so much bigger than today's geopolitics or the coronavirus. For us, hope, hope is so much, much more than wishful thinking or a stoicism or marketing a hype that's thrown at us. Uh, whatever war you're involved in, one person with God uh, is still a majority. God's rope of hope means we have all that we need to be bold and confident like Rahab today, right now. It means we, we can lead the way and show the world the reason for the hope that we have. Amen. Amen.